In the Dharma talk we listened to last night, John Lee mentioned four kinds of virtue. And the very first one was restraint of the senses, what in Pali is called indriya sangvara sila. Now oftentimes this is misconstrued. It's construed saying, okay, you don't look, you don't listen, don't smell. Deny the senses, shut them off. And it sounds pretty impossible. And it's not what the Buddha said. He says you keep watch over the doors of your senses. But basically the purpose is to keep watch over the doors so you can catch greed, anger, and delusion coming out and try to divert them. Because there are ways of looking at sights, sounds, smells, looking at sights, listening to sounds, smelling aromas, tasting flavors. That actually aggravates the defilements in the heart. And there are other ways of looking that help to bring them under control. The sights themselves are not at fault, nor the smells, nor the tastes nor the sound. It's the mind's tendency to go running after them and create all kinds of suffering for itself. That's the problem. That's what we've got to keep in check. So the restraint here is twofold. One is kind of keep restraint on the mind and also keeping restraint on the, on the senses. Because as long as you're not able to deal with certain sights or smells, you should not get involved with them. Don't take them on when the mind doesn't feel up for them, when it can't handle them. Find ways of avoiding them, or find ways of looking at them that can sort of defuse the issue. Like that chant we had just now in the 32 parts of the body. A lot of people don't like it. There's hardly been a person who's come up here and said, why do we do chant that chant? Well, it's a very useful chant. Because the big issue in our lives is our attraction first to our own body, then to other people's bodies. Yes, incites the mind more than anything else. And yes, it is natural, and yes, it is a normal part of life, but it also just creates a lot of problems. Look at lust. And John Sawat used to like to say, there are more murders created that committed in the world between people who've had sex than be people between people who haven't had sex. If sex were such a good thing, why do people kill each other over it? Of course, not everybody commits murder, but there's just a lot of unskillful mental states that get aggravated through lust. And so we have to begin to look at it not so much as our friend, but as something that really causes problems. And so it's good to have tools to keep it in check. And one of the ways, one of, the ways of doing that is when you see something that's really attractive, We'll start taking it apart, and as John Lee said in another one, another one of his talks, if you see something pretty, look for its ugly side as well. That may seem harsh to do it to other people, so you do it to yourself first, sort of equal, equal, th equalize things out. Because oftentimes it's our own attraction to our bodies, which are, what creates the bridge to be attracted to other people's bodies. So take your own body apart, and if you're afraid that this is a negative, creates a negative body image, well, yes, it does, but it's a healthy negative body image unhealthy ones, when you see your body as ugly and other people's bodies as attractive. The healthy one is you say, we're all in this together. The same kind of stuff, from one person's body to the next. If you took your lungs out and put them on display, they wouldn't look that much different from Miss America's lungs. Or anybody's lungs who's, consi who's considered attractive on the outside. And so on down the line with all the body parts. You take it apart, you realize that there's not that much there that you could really get attracted to when you really don't blind yourself to these things. There's an active ignoring of these aspects of the body, which is why there's such a resistance to contemplating this way. But it's a healthy contemplation to learn how to open up your eyes and see the whole thing so that you can counteract this power of lust in the mind. The image they like to use in Thailand is of a lizard that's hiding in a termite's nest. You know those termite's nests that they build up that are like pillars, and they have different holes where the termites come in and out, and they say, okay, there are six holes in the termite's nest, and there's a lizard hiding inside. So you watch over the holes and see which one the lizard is going to come out. 
The lizard stands for the defilements of the mind. The holes stand for the sense doors. So in other words, again, the, the problem is not with the object. It's with the mind's tendency to create suffering in the way it relates to that object. In Pali, they use the word asua, outflow, or effluence, things that flow out of the mind. Fermentations, things that come bubbling up in the mind go out. Because sometimes there's the desire for lust, and then you want to look for something to latch onto. There's the desire to get angry, so you look, at some, look for something to latch your anger onto. So you can build up all kinds of delusions around that. The tendency of the mind to create issues is just amazing. When it gets really extreme, it becomes, you know, mental illness. Stalkers go after people. They think that the person is attracted to them, and no matter what the person does, running away, yelling at them, refusing to look at them, they still think, well, it's a sign that the person's attractive. They take any input at all and turn it into delusion. And that's just an extreme case. We all do this to some extent or another, have certain delusions that we like to maintain, and so we do everything we can to shore them up. As for using the creative faculty of the mind to help relieve our suffering, that's something that requires a lot of training. But that's what we're doing right now. Learning how to take our perceptions, and instead of creating or aggravating greed, anger, delusion, we used to focus on things that will allay that. You start with ways of dealing with the senses, avoiding issues that cause problems. Say that you just can't handle them right now. Because we're all, you have to act like a person who's sick. And there are certain foods that are going to aggravate your illness, so you have to avoid those foods as long as you're ill. Our minds have these mental illnesses. And in order not to aggravate these illnesses, there are certain things you just avoid. And if you can't avoid them, well, you learn to look at them in a way that diffuses the issue. There's a story they tell of a martial, art, martial arts master in China whose students were going to have a martial arts demonstration one day in this pavilion out in the forest. And on the road into the pavilion, there was a donkey. And the donkey was known to be ferocious in a donkey's way. In other words, anyone who walked past it would kick him. And so the martial arts students heading to the pavilion saw the donkey and they decided, well, here's, a, here's an excellent opportunity to test and display our skills. So the first student went up to try one stance against the donkey, and the donkey kicked him across the road. The second student came up and said, you fool, that's not how it's done. He tried another stance, he got kicked across the road. And then all the students got kicked off across the road, no matter what stance they tried against the donkey. So they decided to wait and see, well, how is the martial arts master going to handle this? So they waited and hiding in the trees on the side of the road, and they watched, and the martial arts master finally came around, he saw the donkey, and he walked way around the donkey. In other words, a lot of wisdom is learning how to avoid issues, not getting involved when you don't have to. When you do have to, okay, there are mental exercises we use, like the contemplation of the body to deal with lust, contemplation of goodwill to deal with anger and hatred. The Buddha says when there's someone you don't like, someone you, you have to realize, okay, there are certain things in their behavior that's not good, and there are certain things in their behavior that is good. Try to focus on the good things so you don't hate them. He says, like someone who's like a monk who uses rags to sew his robes. He climbs along the road and he sees this rag, but the rag is soiled and dirty in one part of it, and so he takes his foot to cut off the good part, the clean part, and leaves the soiled part behind. And even when people you don't like are just totally bad. There's nothing that they've ever done that's been any good, nothing they've ever said that's been any good, nothing they've ever thought. The Buddha said, still, you should feel pity for them, because their behavior is going to take them to a bad destination. So you've got to think, okay, well, what can be done so this person doesn't have to go to that bad destination? How can they stop this unskillful mental or verbal or physical act behavior? These are just some of the exercises we use to, so that objects 
that would normally attract our greed and lust can, can be diffused. Things that would ordinarily attract our anger can be diffused. And then we meditate even further so we can deal with the objects that ordinarily be a source for building up delusions. Just looking at this propensity of the mind to just create issues where they don't exist. And learning how to catch yourself as you're in that act of creation. As long as you've got to create, well, create states of concentration, states of stillness, states of well-being in the present moment. So that you're not so hungry for creating issues outside, for feeding on things outside. You say, I've got something really good right here, something really worth maintaining. The better the inner state of concentration, the better your the state of well-being that you create here, the less likely you are to get involved in issues outside. It's just not worth it. All these crazy problems we create. When you've got something better inside, you realize, well, that's junk food. That's child's play. Who needs it? And the mind attains a state of maturity that it can outgrow these things. So first we practice restraint of the senses to, to allow us to have that space inside, give us a chance to start creating that space and maintaining it. And as that space gets stronger, okay, the restraint of the senses becomes easier because you've got something better and better and better inside, so the outside issues just fade away. Finally, you get to the point where you really understand the mind's propensity to create issues, to play games with itself, and you can take it apart. At that point, there are no dangers left. The illness is cured. But even then, you find the, the great forest masters, for instance, they still are very restrained in their actions. Why? It's because it, they don't need that stuff out there anymore. They've got something a lot better inside. So sometimes we think of restraint of the senses as deprivation, but it, it's a kind of training technique you need. When you, when you think about people training for athletics, you know, the coach will say, okay, avoid this, don't drink, don't get involved in that, don't get involved in this because it's going to ruin your strength. Well, the same principle applies to the mind. While you're training the mind, there's certain things you've got to avoid, certain things you have to learn how to defuse. So you can have this space where the mind really can develop that inner space, that inner strength, that inner sense of well-being. So be very careful in your looking and your listening and your smelling and your tasting and your feelings. Tactile sensations. When you show care there, then you find you turn around, you can start being more sensitive and being more careful inside as well. Because after all, the more you look, the more you listen, the more you realize, okay, the issues aren't out there, the issues are in here. So try to show care in all that you do, so you create the least amount of suffering as possible. And show care for looking after the mind, because the state of your mind is your most important possession. When you build up strength inside, as John Lee used to say, don't let it go leaking out your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body. Have a sense of the value of the, of the health of the mind. and do everything you need to do in order to maintain it. 